My guest today is Sam Nasser. Sam, how you doing? Very good, Dave. How are you? I'm doing really well. It's really good to see your face. It's been way too long. It has been. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. What do you do, Sam? So I've been a software developer since uh, the ni 1995, uh, and I've been active mostly in the Microsoft stack, uh, probably for the last 20 years, and uh, even more recently, been focusing on uh, Azure and Azure Cognitive Services. Cognitive services. Tell me about that. So I was really moved back in 2016 where uh, there was a video that was uh, shown at, uh, I believe it was Ignite uh, at a Microsoft conference where one of the Microsoft developers who's actually blind uh, and he lives in, uh, in the UK actually worked on cognitive services and he was demonstrating it in the video where basically even though he was vision impaired, he sat down at a restaurant, held up his phone and then through the camera, I was able to describe the people around him. He held it up on the menu. It read the menu to him, uh, and it just helped him with his day-to-day -day life. Uh, and I thought that was really moving because now we're using technology not just to process uh, transactions coming and going from uh, one corporation to the other, but now we're using it to better humanity and, and to make life easier for others that are impaired. I remember that video. I remember having exactly the same reaction. It was inspiring. That yeah. technology could change someone's life as much as it had. Uh, I think his name was Sasha or something. Right. And uh, and that that he helped he helped build that technology. I think. Yep, yeah, he did. It was very uh, interesting. So un under the hood was uh, of the technology of this, this phone app that let him read the menu and uh, pointed at a, a scene or a person and tell say say what what, what he would have been seeing had he been a sighted person. What. Uh, that was cognitive services, right? Was it was, that? yeah, under the hood. And the beautiful thing about it is Microsoft has essentially democratized all these services. So you no longer need to be a machine learning expert or an AI expert, but rather if you can just simply make a web API call, you can leverage these services. Yeah, democratized is a good word. It's a, a, It used to be really, really hard. There was a huge barrier to entry to doing any kind of machine learning or artificial intelligence. Yeah, it's um, also hard to say if you have a dry mouth. <laughs> <laughs> what's, uh, yeah, it's, it's early in the morning here. Uh, what's, um, uh, well, so how does it work? What's, uh, what is cognitive service? I, that's, I know that's a big question, but. <laughs> so it, uh, basically it's uh, divided up into four separate areas where you have decision, speech, vision, and language. Uh, and the beautiful thing about it is uh, that you can essentially leverage these services um, to utilize, um, I'm sorry, did I say that the category is right? You it's said decision. decision, speech, vision, and language. Is that correct? Right. Yes. Okay. Um, you're right. It is early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I wrote it down. Right. So in any case, uh, essentially, the, these are the four main categories. What you can do, there's also subcategories, if you will. So for example, with speech, you can convert speech to text, uh, text to speech. You can do translation in various other languages almost real time. Um, there's also uh, within the, the vision services, uh, it can get a little bit confusing, but there is computer vision and then custom vision. Uh, so with computer vision, you have services like image analysis, spatial analysis, and OCR. Uh, custom vision is also broken into other categories such as image classification and object detection. And I worked a little bit with uh, custom vision and absolutely fell in love with it the, the minute I started working on it. Essentially, you can hold up an image or submit an image to the web service. After you train it, it can detect certain items or objects within that image. So for example, as you're viewing me here, there's other objects in the background. I have some things framed, my- Your MVP oh, trophy. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and then you see a, a desk over on the other side. So, that, and obviously myself in the middle. So there's a lot of objects that are occurring within this image. I, I can upload this image and it will detect all these various objects if I train it accordingly. Okay, so it's seen uh, desks before. It's seen many times pictures of desks. And so it recognizes what a desk generally looks like. And it says, oh, there's a picture. It reminds me of uh, these, uh, these million other desks I've seen. 
Right. Well, yes, to a degree. So there are domains, pre-built domains that you can utilize when you're training the, the service. But let's say things like an oil filter. That's something that is not in a pre-built domain provided by yeah. Microsoft. So right. I can train it so that it can actually detect what an oil filter looks like. And so where this carries over into businesses is now it creates a better user experience where I'm, I no longer have to walk into a uh, or step up to a kiosk and, and know that I need to order, to order an oil filter, but rather I can just hold up an image and say, I want this thing. Uh, and it will detect that it's an oil filter and then it will respond accordingly. Oh, okay. It sounds, I think I was describing computer vision and you were describing custom vision. Yeah, like I said, it can get a little bit confusing, uh, but uh, yes, so there's uh, the two different subcategories, and depending whether you're doing spatial analysis or object detection, uh, it could be one or the other. Uh, okay. Uh, and then it, there's some context involved as well. Like, it could not only recognize that uh, I'm looking at a picture of a man's face right now, but it could know that it, that it's Sam or that Sam is smiling or, you know, uh, whether he's wearing glasses, things like that. Exactly, right. Um, and that could be used for security purposes as well. So, for example, uh, Sam may have clearance to enter a specific area, whereas David may not. So we can use this as a uh, security clearance or authorization type of application. Very cool. Well, we've got four categories to cover. Let me, let's just go through each one a little bit at a time. Uh, we, we covered vision pretty well. Uh, tell me about the speech. Uh, so speech, uh, again, speech to text, text to speech. And the nice thing about that is uh, I, I no longer am forced to interact with a user through the screen. I can now do it via audio. So I can speak to the application and then likewise the application can speak back to me. And what I've done in the past is I piggyback that on top of Lewis, the language understanding serv intelligence service, which we'll probably talk about next. Okay. Um, and so this way I can submit a phrase to Lewis It'll respond back with what the intention is, and then I can do my processing on the back end, meaning uh, I submit a phrase to Lewis to say, I want to buy a car. <clears throat> it detects that I am, my intent is to purchase a vehicle. And so in, the, in my application, I will query my database and say, okay, we have X, numbers, X number of cars in stock. And instead of displaying it on the screen, now I can actually speak back to the user. So... It provides a, a better user experience, more human-like, uh, without the, the traditional type into the keyboard and then view the results on the screen. Yeah, okay. So uh, speech-to-text and text-to-speech, it brings us into the, this used to be science fiction a few years ago. Right? The Star Trek would always just talk to the computers instead of typing anything in. Um, exactly. and, uh, and I get that. What does Lewis specifically add to that? Okay, so with Lewis, <clears throat> like I mentioned, uh, let's take the sentence, I want to buy a car. Okay, what if I said to a dealer, I'm interested in buying a vehicle, or can you sell me a car? If you look at those three sentence structures, they're all different, right? But the intention of the user is still the same, to buy a vehicle. So it will take natural spoken English, and again, if you train it accordingly, it will come back and say the intent is to buy a car. It'll reply back with a text token that you have designated, and it will tell you that that's what the user's intention is. Now you can take that intent and then do processing in your app. And what I have done in previous demos is to show that essentially you query the database and you say, I have uh, you know 10 Mustangs in stock, uh, five Corvettes, uh, what have you. Um, you can even dig a little bit deeper and say, I'm looking to service my vehicle. So we'll detect that you're no longer interested in buying a car, but rather servicing your car. Uh, same thing if someone said, I want an oil change or I want to change my tires. All three of those sentences reflect that the user wants service on their vehicle, mm -hmm. right? Different sentence structure, but yep. the intent is still the same. Got it, okay. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is really powerful because computers uh, since forever have always been really good at responding to specific instructions. Exactly. If I type the code exactly a certain way, or if I give a command a certain way, they will respond in exactly the same way. And this extends it so you don't have, you know, we as human beings, we're not like that. We we tend to be real fluid in our communication styles. Absolutely. If they can respond to that, that makes them so powerful. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, as developers, what happened if we were to misplace a semicolon or God right. forbid take one out, right? It's just compile errors all over the place. 
So it, it's very structured, and things have to be where they have to be. Okay, um, and uh, we, said we covered uh, speech, vision. How about language? Language, okay. So with that, uh, it allows us, well, uh, language is, uh, also encompasses uh, Lewis, but then okay. you also have things like uh, Q&A Maker, uh, text analytics, and the translator within the language category. Oh, okay. So Q&A Maker, essentially, you can provide a document of your frequently asked questions and submit that to the Q&A Maker, and basically it acts as your concierge, sort of speak, for your application, meaning um, I want to find out uh, how late the dealership is open till. So I can type that question, it will query the results that I have, or the questions that I trained it on, and then we'll respond back with the results. Um, you can also do sentiment analysis, which is very cool. You know, so if you say, um, I, needed, uh, I needed this like I needed uh, a flat tire early in the morning, right? <laughs> Obviously, I'm being sarcastic, right? So it can detect that as well. Uh, so it detects sentiment analysis, and this is useful where for organizations that you want, or they want to monitor their social media, uh, mm -hmm. so they can detect the sentiment of overall what people are tweeting or uh, posting on Facebook, etc. Hmm. Okay. Well, sarcasm is like a, a second language to me, so this is near to my heart. <laughs> uh, and the last one you mentioned was decision making. Yeah, so that one's very interesting. So with that, there's a what's called a personalizer service. Um, and again, there's three different uh, subcategories within it. There's the personalizers, there's the content moderator, and then there's the anomaly detector. So with personalizer, for example, what that does is uh, it kind of, it learns what your habits are. So for example, if I am used to ordering a salad for lunch every day, then the next day I step up to the kiosk and it will present me, if it knows that I am Sam, it will present me with a list of salads that I'm interested in, in getting, as opposed to other items that I that I might purchase. So it's more personalized and targets what the, the user's intent is um, and kind of makes a, a better user experience. Interesting. You mentioned that these are Azure services that you call through an API, correct? Correct. Um, is it, tell me about the performance. Is there latency in building an application when you're calling out to cognitive services? And how do you handle that? So there's a little bit of latency, but not a whole lot. Um, and basically it's, you would make an async call. Um, and just like we would with other applications that we've done in the past, if it's something that's going to take a while, you just simply let the user know that it's, it's working in the background, you know, please wait, and then you can respond. Typically response time has been very quick. Um, and it does come in various tiers as far as the pricing. So, you know, the, the, you'd have to build your application depending on the number of users and, and the scalability. Uh, you'd have to accommodate for, for some uh, wait time. Uh, again, we're making a web call and it's, it's got to be done asynchronously. This is all very cool. Is this um, something, I know you're a conference speaker and a user group speaker and, and you run a couple of user groups. <laughs> and, uh, but um, are you using this for your customers? Are you building applications using cognitive services? Yeah, so there are a couple of customers that I'm working with regarding this. Uh, so one of them, basically, <clears throat> they're looking for a, a, a custom vision to recognize objects. And uh, with their scenario, they're working in a, in a very dusty and very dirty environment. Uh, also, there's extreme heat that's involved. And so it needs to read it from a distance. Barcode readers and scanners wouldn't cut it. Okay. And so we're using uh, cameras, high def cameras that essentially would take the picture from a distance so that way we're, we're keeping the heat away uh, and it would recognize the image and identify the uh, that specific uh, cart, if you will. So we have cars moving in and out on rail and we need to identify what, the, what they are. And so again, from a distance, we're able to just capture the image and then identify what that car is or the number on it. Uh, and it's using a variety of different objects because if we were just to, to write one, two, three on it, the numbers and the curves of the letters would essentially accumulate dust and dirt over time, and then they wouldn't be readable. Hmm. So we had created these various objects uh, to recognize, to be recognized from a distance, and over time, they wouldn't accumulate dust on them. It's a very niche environment, uh, so it, it's not for every customer, but another customer that I'm working with, essentially, we're utilizing uh, text-to-speech and speech-to-text 
so they're communicating with the app um, and so we're no longer dealing with writing things on the screen but rather interacting uh, vocally with the application nice very cool is there, is there anything we haven't talked about that we should have um well, one thing that I would mention is we can really leverage cognitive services is you piggyback them on top of each other, use them in, in parallel or in series with each other. For example, uh, with Lewis, that's a, a perfect example. You can talk to the application and then basically we'll convert that speech to text. You take that text, you submit it to Lewis because that's how Lewis basically works is it needs actual string data to, to decipher. Okay. And then likewise, it will respond back with a JSON result set where you parse that for a specific phrase that you're looking for mm. uh, or the string token of the intent. And then you do your processing on the back end, meaning you're querying your database for the customer's intention. And then you're, the application will respond back with text. You take that text and then convert it to speech. So now we used uh, three services in series where we're just doing vocal transactions with the application. Very cool. Where does where do people go to learn more about this? So you can go to uh, uh, Azure, um, and the, they list the cognitive services there. Uh, you obviously, you'll need an account, but a free account's always available. Uh, also, the pricing tier, there's free of charge uh, testing where you can utilize and, and test the, the apps, uh, but there's also the, the paid pricing tiers. In addition, one thing I wanted to mention, along with every service that we're using in Azure, when you set up the resource, you also need to go to another portal outside of it to build your model. So for example, with Lewis, I would set up my resource group and then add the resource for Lewis into it or language understanding. And then once I get the keys that that uh, resource makes available for me, then I go over to Lewis.ai and I build my model. Same thing with custom vision, uh, I believe the website is vision.ai or customvision.ai and you go there and you build your model and then you use the keys that were given to you in, in the Azure portal to link to the model that you're building in the portal. That customvision.ai is correct, I just checked. So it's a, it's a combination of uh, registering the service, going to configure the service and then writing code to call the APIs. Correct. It's not that way for uh, every application or every service, but uh, in some cases, again, you have to get the Azure portal and then the external portal and link the two together. Got it. Uh, are you speaking about this or writing about this somewhere? I am. I have several things on my calendar coming up uh, regarding Lewis. I am also hosting the uh, global AI event, uh, thanks to the oh, global tell me AI about that. That will be on October 19th. Uh, it's in the evening um, where Cleveland is one of uh, three cities so far in uh, in the U.S. that are hosting that event. So, oh, very cool. I, I don't know if this will be out before October 19th, So, but it, will it be recorded and online available? It will be recorded and the recordings will be posted on my YouTube channel. Excellent. Send me a link to that and I'll put that in here as well. Absolutely. And if the, the viewers are interested, you can subscribe to the channel and you'll get notifications once the videos are uploaded. Excellent. Well, Sam, thank you so much. I'm really glad I had a chance to talk to you after like four years of <laughs> being isolated. And I'll be making out to Chicago. Yeah, always a pleasure seeing you, whether in person or online. Thanks a lot. You stay safe. Thanks, you too. If you're in technology, let's be friends.